Chavkovsky will talk in the next few minutes about do-it-yourself Java and Kubernetes. Have fun. Okay. Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks, even for the introduction. Or zdravite, sički. Uh, so it's my second time here in front of the Bulgarian audience. The first time was amazing, so hopefully this time I will do uh, nice as well. I have live demos for today, so I'm praying to the gods of live demos that everything will go fine. Also, I have 50 minutes. I'm quite skeptical about that, but afterwards we have like 40 minutes break. So I hope that the organizers will not get mad. So uh, first of all, uh, for those of you that don't know me, uh, my name is Panche. I come from Macedonia. I am a senior software engineer in a company called Netcetera. Uh, we have offices in Skopje. I'm the current uh, Java user group leader in Macedonia. I'm also one of the administrators of this CodeFu uh, competition, algorithmic competition that we organize. And also, I'm a huge hardware and IoT enthusiast, and I'm very crossed with the organizers of the conference, because currently, in the next room, it's Sky Cruiser. They are giving talks about home automation, and I'm here. So thanks a lot for that. <laughs> yeah, uh, so uh, me on the internet, on Twitter, you can find me. Uh, uh, my handle is Silometos. It's everywhere on the internet, by the way. And every once in a while, I blog on pancha.mk. First of all, before I start talking today, uh, just a short disclaimer. So I'm in no way affiliated neither with Google, nor Pivotal, nor Docker, although I'll be presenting their technologies today, and I'm not even getting paid for this. <laughs> that's OK. That's my fault. Uh, so yeah, this is not an expert talk. Uh, all of this is just my findings and my experiments, but I think that I'm kind of getting on the topic, you know, to get you all um, into uh, all of this. Uh, and also, uh, many thanks to these two guys, Israel Tsang, Kanari, and Vassing. So they had a nice presentation on last year's DevOps, and I kind of got the inspiration from there, so I said I want to do something similar, so yay, today I'm here. Okay, um, so I want to talk about several things. Uh, first of all, it's Spring Boot. Uh, who of you know Spring Boot or have? Yeah, OK. So I will not get uh, too much into this. So what is Spring Boot? Well, Spring Boot is sort of like a simplification for uh, starting and configuring Spring apps. Uh, it comes along with its pre-configured dependencies. It has its own embedded uh, application server. Uh, it packs into JAR, you know, that, that famous pivotal stuff, or what Josh Long actually is saying on every, on every other conference, saying that make JAR not war. Um, and what they actually claim it to be is that this is sort of like cloud native Java. Why is it called cloud native Java? Because basically you're just packing one binary, and that binary you can afterwards deploy it into various containers there that are already present in a lot of cloud uh, platforms. Uh, if you want to get started, so check out this page, start.spring.io. It's pretty cool. Uh, you, there you just uh, you have a bunch of checkboxes. You just select your dependencies. You click make your project, then you extract it, and there you go. You already have a starting Spring, pro, uh, Spring Boot project. Uh, let's go further on. So we have Spring Boot, and we can combine it with Docker. So we can containerize it with Docker, and it's rather simple. Why it's rather simple? Because you have only one jar file, and running it is basically just java-jar and the jar file. That's it. So making it, uh, containerizing it with, with Docker is plain simple. And we can even make it even more simpler. So what do you need to do in this situation? So first of all, have a Spring Boot app already packaged, already there, and you have Docker installed. Uh, then the second thing you need is a Docker file. So you don't really need to reinvent the wheel every single time when you make a Docker file. You just make one and then just copy it every, on, on every other application that you have. Uh, next thing that you can use, you do not really need to manually do all this docker.build and then specify the tag and everything. You can use the, uh, this uh, Docker Maven plugin made by the guys from Spotify. A huge thanks to, to them for that. Uh, so what you do, you just have already a Maven application. You just include this Maven plugin there. And whenever you do this uh, docker.build run, uh, it will immediately build and register uh, the, um, the already built Docker container onto your machine. Afterwards, you can either run it or you can push it, whatever. It's all your choice. So let's see how actually this works. So this is my first demo. Uh, what I would like to do is just how one Spring Boot application works. How, uh, how does the Docker file look like? Uh, how can you configure the Spotify Maven plugin? And at the end, how can you run it or just push it to, uh, to the Docker Hub? So uh, okay, the application that actually I'm going to present today, it's very stupid looking. 
Uh, and it's something that I made for the students in the University of Skopje, where I was explaining Spring Boot, and I just decided to reuse it here, or I was lazy enough to not to do something else. Uh, so what the application does is basically a very simple block platform. It just had an index, you can add blocks, you, uh, you have users in the background. Currently, you have only just one user. Uh, you log in, you write blog post, you read blog post, that's all. Currently, it's just a very plain Spring Boot application. So again, you just have the, the starting point, you have the Spring Boot application, then you have the controllers here, have like two, index login, nah, not to go any much into detail, have a very simple model, have just one blog post and user, and repositories for that. And here, yeah, I'm going quite to, uh, to the depth of using Spring Boot, so with the repository as resources and everything. So let's go to the interesting parts. First of all, uh, you have a, a source uh, folder, source main Docker, and here I have the Docker file. It's basically the same Docker file every single time. We have just the core image, the base image for making, uh, for Dockerizing Java applications. Then you have some blah, 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 blah. Uh, we have just the, the generated jar file. Uh, we're renaming it, we're copying it as to the up jar file, and then we just define the entry point to run Java minus jar to the up jar. That's all. Now the second part is how to automate that. So in my POM file here, in the Maven configuration that I have, um, first of all, in the properties, I have this, this is Docker image prefix. Uh, so what is the prefix? This is basically the location and the, uh, well, username or like a private uh, repository, private hub of yours where you will actually publish uh, you will push the, uh, the, gener the generated uh, container, uh, the generated image file, though. Uh, so if you're using just Docker Hub, then you just need to state your username. That's all. So my SciLocker, it's already uh, out there. And this thing here, it's actually my private hub at uh, Google Cloud Platform. I will talk about it more into detail. So just be aware that this is already here. It's already configured. So this is like the first part. And the second part here in the Maven build it's the inclusion of the Spotify Docker Maven plugin. So what I'm doing here is just Docker Maven plugin. I'm saying where the Docker directory is, where the Docker file is, what the, um, the target uh, image name would be. So here I'm using the prefix and the artifact ID, which in this case is just Kalu block. Um, resources, this is again, very copy paste material. Uh, and at the end, just images. So whenever I'm creating an image, I'm tagging it with latest and with the version here. So is this thing working? So I can just easily say, okay. Run as Maven build. So let's clean it first. Um, very important, you need to package the, the application prior to uh, executing Docker build and at the end, Docker build. So, yay, let's see if this thing works. Scanning, building, blah, 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 blah. Node tests and Docker Maven plugin. You see here, it's building the image. So, GCRI, premium work. This is actually my unique username, sort of like on the Google Cloud Platform. And at the end, I have it. So this is the image starting. So if you don't believe me, I can just go Docker images, and you can see, well, I have a lot of Docker images, though. But uh, nevertheless, it's here. So I can just say, OK, I'll copy this, copy, and I'll go look run, mapping the ports, 8080, 8080, and then the name of the image plus the um, the version, and there you go. We have a Spring Boot application, and it's already been Dockerized. We're running it as a Docker container. So uh, this is using in-memory database. It's using H2. Uh, it's immediately populating a uh, standard uh, admin admin user at the beginning. So no need. To, I mean, this is just for demo purposes. I mean, normally you will not do that, but nevertheless, at the end you have this. So the application is already here. So you see, much styling. Yeah, that's. Actually, what I do, if you don't believe me that it's working, then yeah, I have already here, I have index, I can now create a new blog post. I can do something, I can add some content here, I can go create, and there it is. I already have one blog post. Okay, now this was very, very simple, but nonetheless, this is the procedure for every other application that you actually need to do there. Now let's go one step further. So the second thing I want to talk about is Kubernetes. I'm not really sure if it's pronounced like that. It's actually a Greek word. And if we're reading Greek, I don't know if anyone here reads Greek, I do believe that it's read as it's, been, as it's written, so it should be Kubernetes. I don't know. What is Kubernetes? <laughs> Again. Uh, so it's a Greek word coming from Helsman or Pilot. It's an open source container cluster management or a cluster container orchestrator, as it is. 
Uh, its real definition is something like an automated system for uh, open source system for automated deployment, scaling, controlling, maintenance of uh, containers that are dispersed through a series of uh, container clusters. Um, but it's actually Kubernetes, it's based on Google's Borg. I don't know um, how many people actually know that. So Google have their, this huge infrastructure inside, and it's sort of like the same thing. So they have like a centralized, well, it's still centralized, but still distributed, though. And what they do, actually, is that they're executing binaries, but they're scaling binaries, like on the scale of 10,000, let's say. You just make one binary, you uh, define afterwards how this binary will uh, perform. So you say, this is the binary, it will be named like this, it should do this, 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 this. And then you just pass this information to Borg Central, let me call it like that, and uh, you just say scale it to 10,000, and Borg will immediately make like 10,000 containers of it. Now, Kubernetes is basically the same thing, it's just that it's open source, it's focused solely on containers, and uh, it's free to use for everyone. Uh, by the way, uh, so it's originally created by Google, and even right now it's backed by Google, uh, but it's free to use, and uh, it's no longer like in sole possession of Google. So Google uh, teamed up, partnered up with the Linux Foundation, and they made this Cloud Native Computing Foundation, and there they have Kubernetes as their starting up project. So it's kind of like in the open area. How can you use Kubernetes? Uh, so first of all, you can just download it, you can install it on your own commodity hardware. You can just have one PC, and you can install Kubernetes on top of it. Little less that it will not be scaled through a variety of nodes. But it's already there. So you can use it on your own commodity hardware. You can use it on Raspberry Pis, as I have it here. Uh, the second place where you can use it, you can use it into existing Docker clusters. So if you have like Mesos or if you have Swarm, you can already pass Kubernetes there. It can even work in its own containerized environment, which is pretty cool. Or third, you can use it in, uh, in the Google Cloud Platform. I have demos, by the way, today. And uh, in order to make them more simple, to make them more uh, fast, and not to, uh, well, not to bother myself with a lot of details, I'm using actually a cluster already present at the Google Cloud Platform. By the way, you can all create an account there. They're offering like 60 days of free uh, service. You can populate your own cluster of six nodes there, but just don't accelerate a lot with the resources that you're consuming. So I have this. Uh, it's basically Google Cloud Platform alongside with the Google, uh, Google Container Engine, and which is basically Kubernetes on Google Cloud Platform. That's all. Uh, I'm using uh, gCloud SDK. So there's like the, the SDK is like utility, command line utility in order to access your cluster and to uh, process your cluster to maintain your cluster much more easier. And uh, with every uh, account that you're making, you immediately have your own private Google Container Engine hub. So if you know, for example, on Docker Hub, you can only create one private repository, which is solely by you. But here, you can create as much as you want. And they are all directly connected to your cluster. So whenever you're like pulling images, they're already there, and they're just solely for you. And it's working quite fast. You will see this quite much in the demos. But what is actually Kubernetes, and what it, why is it so special? I mean, why even I like it? So, First of all, some basic of it. Uh, Kubernetes is kind of employing this uh, immutable infrastructure paradigm. So what is about it? Immutable infrastructure basically says like we need to kill this uh, line that uh, distinctifies what is the machine and what is the application, and that we generally need to ship them together. And as an effect of that, whenever we need to do some changes on the machine or on the application, we're destroying the old one and we're deploying the new one. So that actually means whenever you, you deploy a node, whenever you deploy a container, it's there. It's immutable. If you need to change it, you first need to kill the old one, change the configuration, change the software file, build a new image, and then export the container out of it. That's the sole basics. So it kind of looks like an overkill, but at the end, it's making things much, much more simpler. Everything can be automated. You don't need like three sysadmins or uh, two developers being active there and everywhere collaborating. It's just one script running on the background and it can do whatever you want. Now, what are the key concepts behind Kubernetes? So, these are the four main that I kind of want to talk about. There are even others there, but these are uh, the basics that you need to understand in order to start working with Kubernetes. So, the first one is a pod. What is a pod? Pod is like the single element of execution that you can think of in Kubernetes. By definition, it says that it's kind of like a combination of containers that are designed to work tightly together. Or it can even be just one container. So if you have just one Docker image and you deploy it, it will immediately be encapsulated into a single pod. Because that is the minimum runtime uh, unit that you can actually think of here. 
Next thing is labels. A label is a label. You can add a label on everything. It's a key value stuff. And you can add it on top of everything. You can add it on pods. You can add it on every single element that you're deploying right there. It has no syntactical value whatsoever. But afterwards, they can be reused pretty smartly. And they can be reused in uh, these called selectors. So basically, you can, let's say, you have one Docker image for your application, and you export 10 pods of it. And you say six pods will be production, three pods will be staging, one pod will be test. And you can actually label all of them. Afterwards, on top of them, you can export services, and you can say, OK, now select all of these pods that actually have these labels there. You will see actually this in the example. The third, uh, the third concept is the replication controllers. Um, this is uh, the thing that keeps uh, the system in shape, in a way. So if you ought to do all the things manually, you just need to say, OK, I will populate like 10 containers of it. And then you will populate 10 containers. But what happens if one container dies? What happens if a machine dies? What happens if the container, I don't know, exceeds its resource limits or something? Then you need to manually go there and uh, re-instantiate a new one. Well, Kubernetes actually does that with the replication controllers. What basically says, OK, I need a replication controller. You have this pod definition, and I want 10 replicas alive of it at any single time. And the replication controller will make sure that they are, well, as much as it can, that they are at always 10, uh, 10 pods available. If someone dies, the replication controller will populate a new one. If the, the dead one appears again, then it will kill one of the existing containers. That's actually what it does. But nevertheless, it will always tend to keep the scale that you will define. And the final thing is services. This is making this is kind of like encapsulating the entire system at the end. So you have pods, you have replication controllers, you have labels, but nothing is kind of functioning still. It's just out there. You can access all of these pods directly by their API address, but they're not functional. They're not doing, they're not doing anything. So at the end, you have the services. And the services are exposing the pods either to the inside of the cluster or to the outside world. And they're exposing it as a name, which is very convenient. So for example, if you're making like a microservice application and you have like a service layer, and this service layer has like 10 pods present, you're just exporting them as one service, and you name it service. And if you need to access it from every other point of your cluster, you just name it as service. It's a plain DNS name. It's already there. How can you uh, operate on this? So uh, my favorite is uh, with the command line is the kubectl uh, utility. Uh, you can either go uh, to um, use a web UI, which is available as a plugin, or you can directly use Google Cloud Console. And by the way, what I've forgotten here, there is an API of all this. So kubectl is basically accessing the API, which is a RESTful API. So let's go now with the demo. Let's make things interesting. So uh, this is like the basic Kubernetes usage. So what I want to do is, uh, well, already have an image built and it's already pushed. I want to show you this visualization proxy. It's called GCP Live uh, Kubernetes Visualizer. Um, I will show you how to populate controllers and pods, then how to scale them, how to uh, make a service, how to expose a service out of it, how to do a rolling update. This is very interesting. And at the end, how to clean up all this mess from, um, from the cluster. So first, let's kill this. Yes. Okay. Docker kill. This is E2 something. Okay. Um, this is not here. This is simple. Now let's see on which cluster am I. I'm currently on the GCP cluster. This is good. So let's see what I have here. First of all, I will execute this um, script that is called deploy sh. No, oh, not deploy sh. First, I will do this proxy. So what is this proxy actually doing? It's starting, uh, this is called a kubectl proxy. And it's kind of like starting a local server, which is exposing the target REST API so that you can make local applications that will access it, blah, blah, blah. But the good thing about it is that there is this sweet visualization already done by the guys from Google. And it's at all, at all time, it's presenting the state, the visual state of my cluster. So you will see how actually all these things will start to fill up. So currently, there is nothing. These are all the four nodes that I have, and I have nothing in the cluster whatsoever. So let's put something. So um, the first thing that I want to do is to deploy. So I will run the same uh, image that I run with Docker right now. It's not Docker run, it's QCTL run. I'm passing the image. You can see here that uh, the prefix is already passed it. Uh, these are just some other. And here, all these are labels. So 
pay attention to this label here. It's called visualize equals true. And what this application actually does in the background is getting all the resources that are already there, and it's selecting only those that have this label present. So these are how the, the internal selectors are actually working. So let's deploy it. And what this thing should do, it should create one replication controller and one pod. Now we say, oh, shoot, this will be under heavy load. So we kind of need to scale this. Um, so the next thing is, let's try to scale it. So I already have all these uh, scripts here in order for me not to make some errors in the commands. So I'm just doing kubectl scale, and I said the replication controller kelo block, I need four replicas. So I'll just do scale, and it just says scaled. So I have three new. And you can see how Kubernetes is already populating all of these. So now, if I want to kill one of those, say, I don't know, I will just say cube. CTL, uh, get pods. These are all the pods that I have. I will just select this one. Now, this will be very fast. Uh, cube CTL delete pod. This one. So let's see. Uh huh. Now, yeah, you can see. So I killed uh, the old one, and Kubernetes al already uh, make, ma made a new container. Okay. Um, now, this is all here, but still, I cannot access it because it's all just internal, so I need to expose all that. How can I expose all that? So I have this basic stuff here, so it's just called expose. Can you add some rules to make it scale out of time? How do you say to make it? Ah, to scale in time. Hmm, I don't know how to do that, sorry. <laughs> okay, uh, so the next thing, I need to create a service basically to expose it, so what I'm saying is, okay, so expose the entire replication controller on port 8080, target port again 8080, and this is type load balancer. So this is very important when you say type load balancer. Uh, so on Google Pl Cloud Platform, whenever you say that the service will be exposed as a, as a load balancer, it will create an actual load balancer. And this actual this uh, load balancer will have uh, its own external IP address. So if, I want, if we want actually to access uh, whatever we already did here in Kubernetes, then we definitely need to expose it as a uh, service of type load balancer. So uh, this is already exposed as a service, but it's still inside. So what we're doing right now is basically we're just waiting. Uh, and we're waiting for uh, the Google Cloud Platform to uh, assign us a public, I public I IP. So this actually happens in a few seconds. But if it doesn't, no, I actually have to wait it for. Um, Okay, since now while we're waiting, um, one other cool thing is that you can do a rolling update here in Kubernetes with zero, down zero downtime. So you already have it, uh, uh, everything here, and the replication controller already has its definition of what is uh, the definition of the pod that it is actually replicating. You can change that, and you can instruct Kubernetes how to do the actual rolling update. You can say on every five seconds, kill uh, an existing image. Then after five seconds, populate a new one, and that should be the new version, actually, what we have. So how are we actually doing this um, rolling update? So we have this thing here, it's kubectl, rolling update. Uh, we have the Kelo block. This is the actual replication controller, and we say this is the new version. So if you paid attention, the current version is 002. I will roll updated to 003, and it's update period of five seconds. That means that, that every five seconds, Kubernetes will do something. Either it will kill a new one, or will populate, uh, either it will kill an old one, or it will populate a new uh, image. So now we have the IP address, so if I access this thing here, and I go index, then I should see my, oh, it's port 8080. It's like this. Yay. So this is already executing there. Now, let's update it. So I will say rolling update. Uh, now, five seconds is kind of a lot. So let me just edit it. Roll update. Okay. I put it to three. And roll update. So what is happening right now? So we will go again on the visualizer. So uh, what Kubernetes will do is that it will create one new dummy replication controller. And this replication controller will start, will start populating containers with the new image, while the older one will start killing off its images. And in time, you will see actually how things are going. So uh, the red ones, I don't know if they're actually marked here as red. The red ones are the dying ones, and the yellow ones are the new created. But yeah, this is not very visible here because it's happening quite fast. Oh, no. Yeah, this one is dying. 
So now we have two, I think. Yeah, so we actually see that every three seconds something is already changing there. Da -da 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 -da. And in the meanwhile, the service is still standing there, so we're not destroying anything. I can just refresh things here and it will still be running. But now I'm not sure, ah, actually yes. I'm not sure which, uh, uh, which container will, will be taken into consideration by the load balancer. So you actually uh, saw how the new version is actually. So again, this is my styling. I'm a developer and I'm not a web designer. Uh, but nonetheless, I mean, uh, my point was that. And um, at the end, uh, when the rolling update is finished, the, the new and the old uh, um, replication controller will simply switch places and the old one will be killed away. And now you have completely the updated state of your cluster. And at the end, we need to just clean up everything. That is basically just uh, saying delete everything. So delete the replication controller and delete the service on top of it. So just clean up all this and it should kill away everything. Yes, so the service is gone. The replication controller, it's gone. So we can resume with the next thing forward. Now, this was a very bad example. Why was this a very, very bad example? It's because the application has its own in-memory database and it has no session replication whatsoever. You can actually log into one container and then you will lose your session away. You can write a blog post and then on the other machine it's not there. So how to make this thing right? So first of all, microservices. Everyone knows microservices. It's such a popular topic. I hate all these popular topics, by the way, because Everyone thinks that it, we're kind of like reinventing the wheel, but basically these are things that are in place for a lot of years. So what are microservices? Well, these are microservices. Uh, instead of making just one shitty application, we say, okay, now we'll split it, split it into a lot of shitty mi micro applications, and they will all communicate into a shitty manner. Uh, so this is not my image. I am crediting here to this guy. I just found it somewhere on the internet. Uh, so how can you create actually microservices in Spring Boot? Well, uh, we kind of have the same application, but now we need to split it. And we need to think of the paradigms, we need to think of the actual building blocks of the application and where to split it. Now here I didn't do a lot of thinking, so basically I have a view, I have a model, and I have a controller in the background. So I'm basically splitting the application via the MVC pattern. That's all. So I'm doing that. I'm making just one UI application, one service application, and I'm putting aside the database. But now I'm using a real database. Now I'm using the MySQL database. Uh, second of all, since this is, again, designed to be scaled microservice application, we need to think for that. And in, in order to think of that, we need to think of session replication. What does that mean? That means that whenever you uh, sign in to the application, you're signing to one machine, but your session needs to be replicated on every machine out there because your next request will be on some other container that is present. Uh, so what we're doing here, we're using Redis as a session uh, re replication storage, and Spring Boot has this lovely, very easy functionality to just simply include uh, Redis session replication into your application. Now next, uh, here I will deploy all the resources in Kubernetes in a different manner. I'm going to use YAML descriptors, so it's kind of like a more efficient way if you want to automate everything and if you want to keep in track on what your deployment artifacts actually look like. This is the correct way, by the way, to do it in enterprise. Uh, then I want to show you how these pod operations and failures, no, I already showed you that. That's already fine. And then the actual cleanup. So let's go like this. Now this thing here, I don't need it anymore. I'll just close everything. It's already here. And we're done with this. Now. Uh, first of all, let's go with the service application. So uh, the service application is basically just the exposed uh, REST services. That's all. And it's communicating with, uh, with the database in the background. So now I don't have uh, uh, H2, I have MySQL. And now you can see here how I'm ma making the connection string. I'm saying just MySQL. And why am I doing this? So if you paid attention when I said about services, I said that whenever we're creating a service, it's already exposing it with a name, and that name is present as a DNS entry into your entire cluster. So I'm doing it here. Now in order to test it locally, well, I'm doing some tricks in ETC hosts. So in ETC host, basically service and MySQL are pointing to my machine. And then I'm just playing with ports, so MySQL on 3306. Uh, yeah, 3306, then the service I'm using it on 8081, and the actual application on 8080, and they're working. And I have Redis, by the way. So this is the first part. It's, again, just plain RESTful service. That's all. Then the next part is the UI. Now, uh, in the UI, first, 
since this is the actual entry point uh, of the application, here is the place where we need to do the session replication. And how am I doing this? So first of all, I am including from Spring Boot, again, this is very, very lovely. Oh yeah, I'm also using Haiti OS and everything because it's working with Haiti OS. Uh, but I'm using, not Spring Session, yeah, so I have this, I have Spring Session, and I have this Spring Boot Starter Redis. So this is actually what we're using. And how can we employ it? So we're just creating one configuration file. We have the HTTP session config. It's just this annotation. And we say enable Redis HTTP session. This commented thing here is just uh, a living proof of my failure to make it manually. But at the end, I just found out that it's just here, and it works. That's all. It really works. Um, where is this Redis database uh, present? So again, here if I go into the resources and the application, pro I can see that uh, there it is. The host is Redis. Again, this is uh, done with tricks locally in ETC hosts, and the port is this 1637i. Now what is different in, in this UI uh, is that now we don't have direct access to the service, but we need to communicate via some sort of medium. And this medium is the actual RESTful um, services that we have. So that's why I'm importing HadeOS, that's why I'm using uh, resources and re resource and everything. It's kind of, it's adding a huge overload on your application, but hey, it's split it. You have microservices. So if you want to brag in front of anyone, you have microservices here. Uh, this is the UI, and at the end, the final two pieces are MySQL and Redis. So I don't have them here because they're MySQL and they're Redis. And now the good thing about uh, the Google Cloud Platform is that it already has a bunch of images already present there. So if you want to use MySQL, you just say, I'm trying to make replication controller, and the definition of, of the pods is MySQL. And then just paste some env environment variables inside it, like what's the database name and uh, what is the root password. That's all. But now, as I said, we will do this in a much nicer fashion. So here I have in the deployment, this is actually everything that I want to deploy. So I will start deploying everything uh, piece by piece. So first of all, we need to uh, start deploying this from ground up, and we need the, the integral pieces. So we need the Redis database, and we need the MySQL database. So let's first start the MySQL database. Uh, now, how can we define uh, a resources, a um, Kubernetes resources in YAML? So this is actually how a pod definition looks like. So we say this is a pod. OK, we have metadata. We have labels everywhere. Uh, then we have the containers inside. We can actually put resources on this, by the way. I didn't mention that, but you can limit every single container that you run out there. So if someone just goes rogue, uh, then Kubernetes will immediately kill it. Uh, and then the image is this one. It's MySQL. Uh, 5.6, and it's already present there on the Google Cloud Platform. It's already there. I have the environment variables, as I said, MySQL root password, it's root, <laughs> that's it. And then the actual uh, name of uh, the database, scale block SVC, that's it. Then the port, 3306, and we're accessing like that. Now, this is only the definition of the pod. We're running just sing one single pod. But again, in order to expose it, we need to have a service. And this is how a YAML file for a service looks like. Again, we have a service. Metadata with labels, blah, blah, blah. And at the end, we have the selector. And here we say, this is my SQL. So just find every MySQL name pods that are there and bind the service to them. So let's deploy this. And this is not here. This is here. So we say deploy my SQL. And let's see what happens. <sighs> there it is. This is the pod. And now we're waiting for the service. And there's the service. So it's already functional. It's out there. Now the next thing is Redis, basically very similar. We have Redis, uh, the image Redis. Then we're exposing again a service, port 6379. The selector is Redis, but just now we're using role master. And let's deploy how this thing looks here. So deploy Redis. By the way, this is not complicated at all. So if you just see how these uh, this deployment is basically just kubectl create. We say minus f, which is file. Everything is placed in a resource, and then we just pass the resource that we want to create. And now here, we have Redis. It's already there. And now the two actual pieces of our application. So the first one is the service. The second one is the UI. Now, um, here in the service, first we need to create a replication controller. And at all time, we say, OK, now we will maintain like two replicas out of it. That'll be all. Uh, again. OK, these are selectors yeah, uh, of the pods inside. And then the containers, this is the s very same image, uh, part of the image, actually, that we're creating. So uh, I'm not pushing any images right now. 
but if you want to push a local image, local Docker image to your cloud repository, so what you're doing is just gcloud push, and then you just state the name of the image with its tag. So it's the very same thing as Docker push. So I have this thing, I have then the service on top of it, so let's deploy it. And now here, also for visualization purposes, I have this label which says uses MySQL. This is just something to let us know that this service is using MySQL in the background. So do not kill MySQL if you want to use it. Okay, uh, so let's deploy Kalu service, this thing here. Replication controller service, and it's already there. We have the service. Uh, I mean, the replication controller has two instances, and the service is already there. And at the end, we have the final piece, which is the Kalu block UI. It's already here. And it's creating the Kalu block UI. We have two instances, and then we have the service. And now this service, again, it's exposed as a uh, load balancer. So again, we need to wait in order for us to get a public IP. Um, now, did I want to talk also something about this? No. Uh, so while your pods actually are working there, uh, you're not just sitting around. It's not like, not like that you're uh, estranged from everything that is already deployed on your cluster. So you can access it at any time. Uh, you can target them as actual machines. So one very uh, useful thing that I find, so let's say cube ctl get pods. By the way, the commands are rather simple. So get pods is uh, giving me all the pods that I have in the cluster. I can say get nodes. These are the four nodes that I have. Get rc, this is abbreviation from a replication controller. I have two replication controllers. SVC is for services. So everything's already there. But let's focus on get pods. So I have this thing here. So I'll just select one pod, this one, say copy, and then I will do this, kubectl, logs, pod, no, without it. it's this one, and I will say minus f. <laughs> so right now I'm actually seeing uh, the actual log that the Spring Boot application is um, given away. Uh, even more, you can actually log in to the container as it is your, your actual machine, and you could execute command, please don't do that. It's really not safe, because if you need to do it already, then you're kind of missing the idea of this entire immutable uh, infrastructure paradigm. So don't do that. Now, let's see if we have already a public API. We have a public API. So if I access it, again, it's port 8080. Uh -huh. Okay. It's this thing here. And then here I have the very same application. So now, if you don't believe me that it's working, it is working. This thing here, go to index, create new blog post. Again, so I'm signed in, my session is being replicated everywhere, and this entire thing is functioning already. So now, ev even though this is working, again, it has some failures. So I don't know if you're seeing this, but uh, so the Redis thing is fine, because Redis is uh, rather easy to operate with, but this thing here is a huge bottleneck. Well, huge bottleneck is kind of like a bad term of it, but this is a bottleneck and you really shouldn't do it. But for the sake of uh, making things simple, I'm just using MySQL. If you want to do this properly, then you either need to use a uh, clusterized version of MySQL, so like kind of make multiple of these, or use some already distributed database like Cassandra, or even use Redis again. Or you can even use uh, uh, the Google Bigtable in the background. Uh, and also, um, here for example, if I kill the MySQL database and I reload it again, it is still being treated as a container, which means that no data will be stored in the background. So in order to do that, you need to work with persistent volumes, which is again a functionality that it's already there in Kubernetes. So you just uh, mark a persistent volume, and that is some actual persistent volume which is present somewhere out there. If you're using the Google Cloud Platform, then this is your own data on the Google Cloud Platform that you can use. Okay, so do I have some other demo here to do? No, that's all. And at the end, again, just the cleanup. The cleanup, it's not much. Then just uh, put in a lot of all these uh, kubectl delete uh, stuff, and everything is there. Okay, now si while well, this thing here is cleaning up itself, let's go further. So this is the final piece of my presentation that I have today. So I want just to talk 10 minutes for this thing here. Um, so this is my homemade cluster. As I said, Kubernetes can be uh, installed onto commodity hardware. It can even be installed on Raspberry Pis with some uh, remarks and with some things to have in mind. So the cluster is made of five uh, Raspberry Pi version two. It's not a three, sorry. 
uh, it's running on this operating system called Hyperiot OS, which is basically a uh, modification of Raspbian. And the good thing about Hyperiot is that it already has Docker installed on it, so you can use it. I don't know if you know, but it's very hard to make Docker functioning for ARM-based systems. And here it's already present. And here, Kubernetes is installed with its uh, containerized version. So even Kubernetes is run as a Docker container. And it's functioning well, yeah. Uh, the, the actual thing, uh, so uh, I 3D printed this design. Uh, yeah, I'm breaking right now. Uh, the design is already available at Thingiverse, so if you want to do something similar, just go there and browse Kubernetes, and this is the only uh, search outcome that you will get. So what can you do with this? Well, it's acting like a regular uh, Kubernetes cluster, except that it slower a bit, like three times slower, <laughs> at least um, under my measurements. It's cheaper, it's very cheaper, because it takes only just $35 for one of these units. And uh, the most significant part, this is ARM-based, and this can be quite a hassle. So uh, if you paid attention, I'm currently all the images that I've actually done, I'm building it on my local machine, then I'm pushing it to the G Cloud, and then I'm using it from there. Well, you cannot do this with this thing here. Why? Because I have x86 architecture here on my laptop, and this is ARM, and it simply won't do. If you want to make Docker images that should execute under ARM environment, under ARM platforms, then you need to build it under ARM platforms, and you need to use base images, which are, again, ARM-based. That's all. So uh, every example there that I already showed you, in order to work it from here, I had to change several things. First of all, the Docker file needs, needs some adapting. Uh, then the base image is changed. I'm using... Uh, uh, the images from Hypriot, it says Hypriot RPI Java, it's already there, it has uh, Java version 1.8, it's free to use. Um, and the final building process, uh, I did it on one of the Raspberry Pis, you cannot do it on your own machine. So let's, sh let me show you how this thing here works. Uh, one other interesting thing from the Kubernetes, well, the kubectl application, by the way. So first of all, let you kill kubectl. Okay, so I'm killing the proxy in the background. Um, now I have other scripts here, let's say. So I'll do this switch to ARM. And what this switch to ARM script is that I'm saying use context cluster 51. So kubectl can maintain multiple contexts and multiple clusters. So you need just one computer, you have one kubectl uh, invocation, and it's keeping the configurations of every single cluster that you maintain. And you can easily switch between these. So now I'm, I'm already switched to this. So if I go kubectl get nodes, I'm getting this. So these are the nodes. So there are five nodes here, but the last one simply decided not to work three days ago. I don't know. But the four ones are already working. And you can see here that kubectl, get pods. Uh, it just has the, the master uh, pod, which is uh, the Kubernetes ser service, and everything else is clean. So if I go, uh, oh no, I don't have the proxy. So I will again start the proxy with uh, the visualizer application. So now you can see that I have four different nodes. And these are, so 001 is the local, this is the master one, it's actually .200, and then we have 21, 22, 23, which are the next three Raspberry Pis that I have here. So let's deploy something on it. Uh, so here I have this deploy script, uh, which is very similar to, uh, to the first uh, Docker run that I, uh, that I showed you, except that now you can see that the image where I'm getting it, it's from the Docker Hub and it's kalublock-arm. As I said, these are special, special images made solely for the, the ARM platform. So again, visualize true, I will just deploy it. Let's see, we have it already here, and we have four instances running. Now, as I said, this is rather slow, so I can go cube ctl get pods, and we get this one. Kubectl logs, I'll see what's happening inside, and, uh, oh, it's pending, it's not even starting still, yeah. Running. Let's see now, or not. Or maybe it's a different pot. Well, yeah, it's very slow, minus F. Or maybe we should wait. No, um, let's see like this. Uh, the second thing that we're missing here is that we need, again, to expose this. 
we need to make an actual service. So we have the service already here, and you can see that the service has already been populated and it's been bound. So it's the same usage. Now, I'm saying same, but it's not really the same. Uh, since some inter integral pieces that uh, you can use in the Google Cloud Platform are missing here. So you don't have no, uh, load balancers, for example, because you don't have external load balancer. You can actually just export everything to a public uh, IP. That's all. Uh, second, the service functionality is not as it is directly out of the box. You can export a service, but the DNS is not already there. That's an additional plugin, and that is something that I found out yesterday. Okay, let's see if this thing here, it's already doing something. Yay, there it is. So you can see it's very fast, like very fast. It needs, I think it needed like 120 seconds in order to deploy one Spring Boot application. Oh no, yeah, initialization completed, 40 seconds. No. <laughs> So uh, why I'm waiting, actually, is that I want to show you what will happen when some fault occurs. And faults can occur on 442, I have time. Okay. And faults can occur in any manner. So here we will just uh, improvise a hardware fault. So I will just simply disconnect one of the nodes, and then you will see what is going to happen. So come on, start up. So again, this is the initial application that I showed you. It's using the thin memory database. Again, it's a very bad thing to deploy it, but for the sake of presentation, it's doing his job quite well. Okay. Yes, 152 seconds. Okay, that's even way slower than it's supposed to be. So uh, let's see what will happen not right now. So we have the four nodes here, and here we can see uh, every single pod where is it being deployed. So let's say this one. This is the first node. So I will kill this one. And now, I actually intended this to be quite more interesting, but unfortunately, it's not happening as I want it to happen. So it kind of needs a few seconds in order to detect that it's actually this node is already out. And Kubernetes will say, okay, this node is already out, which will take it out of function. But the actual container here will resume being registered. Then it needs like five minutes or something for Kubernetes to, uh, to realize that actually this container is not responding. So let's just wait for this thing here to turn red. I think that I actually pulled out the right one. Yeah. So in the meanwhile, I can again see what is going on here. Let me get notes. Here we're saying that it's already not ready, and there it is. It's already marked out. So it already knows, but it needs like five more minutes in order to know that uh, it needs to kill this container there as well. So since it needs five minutes and I have two minutes, so uh, time for questions, actually. This time for questions. Any questions? Sorry? The state of the entire. Okay. The ah, can the it? Short for physical nodes. Can Kubernetes power them off if they're not needed to save? Yeah, yeah, cost, yeah. For example? You can manually actually disable or enable an, uh, a node uh, yourself. My question was, can it do it automatically if they're if Kubernetes decides they're not needed, like ver like physical machines? If it's decided they're not there, I'm sorry, I'm not listening to you. Say, say you have. Uh, uh, an application, okay. uh, uh, an application stack of several microservices, okay. and uh, Kubernetes just decides it can it can use three nodes, okay. and the fourth one is obsolete. It, it's just not needed, okay. Uh, in terms of computing power, mm -hmm. the, uh, can it automatically power off the, f the the virtual machine in the cloud to save you cost? Uh, Kubernetes on its own, no. Uh, Google Cloud Platform actually does that. Well, it's not it's not deactivating it, but it's uh, uh, providing the resources of that virtual machine to other clusters. So you're not leasing an actual machine, dedicated machine, solely for yourself. You're actually leasing a shared machine with others. And their, um, their billing mechanism actually works like that. So you're paying like number of containers per number of hours that actually you're using. 
So if you have 10, 10 uh, nodes on your disposal and at any single time you're using only two, you will get built only for those two. But it will not kill off every other. Okay, so it's smarter than Azure then. Yeah, but solely for the terms of money. <laughs> yeah. Okay, uh, there was a question here. Why does it, five, what, why does it take five minutes to kill that? Because uh, it's slow, I don't know. <laughs> Let's see. Mm, no, I don't know. It just takes a lot of time for it to recognize that it's already out there, that it's already out, that it's not present. I have no idea. I can uh, just kill a pod here, and it will immediately notice that, and it will populate a new one. But when it's disconnected from the network, I don't know, it either gives it its own time for it to return back. Because if it kind of destroys it immediately, and then you plug it back, then you have one more, and then you need to kill it off, so it's kind of like extra powers. So it's maybe like a tiny little glitch, at least how I think it is. And that's why I've given it some time. Any other questions? OK, so in theory, <laughs> one of these will again be marked as red, then it will be killed off, and a new, uh, uh, a new container will be populated in its place. So if there are, there are no other questions, that's everything that I had to say for today. So thanks a lot for your attention.